morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Gaffney. I am the group show director for MedTrade, which is the largest trade show and conference uh, that is exclusively dedicated to the home medical equipment market. And I'm very pleased to have a distinguished panel of guests. Let me introduce our guests here. Um, first up, uh, Mr. Tom Ryan. Tom's the uh, CEO of AA Home Care, which is the national association for that works to preserve and strengthen access to care for millions of Americans who require medical care in their homes. Uh, Tom has spent the last 25 years as president and CEO of Home Care Concepts, Inc., a respiratory and home medical equipment manufacturing, co I'm sorry, medical equipment company, which was founded in Farmingdale, New York, where he also serves as the village trustee. So a lot of uh, responsibility there, I'm sure, too, right? Um, so very political, yeah. Uh, Ryan is a founding member of the, and former chairman of the New York Medical Equipment Providers Association and past chairman of A Home Care, which he, as I mentioned, he now leads. Uh, next to Tom, we have Jerry Malicha, uh, Jeremy Malicha, who is the senior director with ResMed. And Jeremy, um, you are with, uh, you're, you're focused on the global healthcare informatics. Um, with for ResMed's healthcare informatics offerings globally. Previously held the role as Senior Director of Product Management Americas, which included respiratory care, patient interfaces, and flow generations, including the recent Americas launch of the new Air Solutions platform. Welcome. Uh, next to uh, Jeremy, we have Michael Sherhan. Michael is the Executive Vice President for Drive Medical. Uh, he's an executive, executive principal for Drive Medical. He joined the company in 2004 with the company's merger of Dr. K International, a West Coast manufacturer and distributor of durable medical products, where he served as president and principal stockholder. At Dr. K, Mike, Mike sir, uh, was able to redirect the company's direction and grow annual revenues to approximately $14 million. And in, in the industry from 1990, 80, 1987, Mike has served as West Coast Division President of the approximately 180 million publicly traded company. So welcome, Mike. And finally, we have... By the way, I just want to clarify, we do find bedside commode sexy in our industry, though. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, on my end here, we have Mr. Seth Johnson, who is the Vice President of Government Affairs for Pride Mobility. Uh, Seth is based in Washington, D.C. The company is headquarters in Pennsylvania. And Seth lobbies uh, and has works very closely with Tom and A Home Care on Capitol Hill, uh, lobbies the Capitol Hill, Congress, the White House, and a lot of interaction with CMS um, on major policy issues impacting complex rehab and mobility providers. He's a former member of CMS, DME Program Advisory and Oversight Committee, which was charged with providing guidance to CMS on issues related to implementation of competitive bidding. And we'll touch a little bit on competitive bidding as well. So what we wanted to talk to you all about today was the idea that home care, and, and specifically home medical equipment, uh, does have a place in the overall continuum of care and is definitely a opportunity to help reduce some of the overall health care costs that we face. Um, according to the OECD Health Statistics <coughs> Survey, uh, the U.S. spent $2.919 trillion dollars on healthcare in 2013. That's $9,255 for every American uh, a year, which is more than every other developed country in the world by far. Uh, in fact, the, the average is about $4,100 for the other developed countries. The closest to us is Switzerland that comes in just a little over 6,000 a year. Um, obviously, we can get into some of this. There's a lot of reasons why our healthcare costs are so much higher. Um, we have higher expectations in certain things. Um, we pay people more typically, and obviously that cost has to be filtered down. Uh, so we're going to touch on that. Uh, Americans expect a certain standard of care, and we typically are not patient as patients. So we want what we want when we want it, and obviously that has to be passed along into, in some cases, higher costs. Um, home care, home medical equipment uh, offers an opportunity to uh, potentially lower some of those costs. So Tom, let me start with you. Uh, for those in our audience who may not be as familiar with home care in the HM industry, can you give us some background on how it developed and what role it has traditionally played in the continuum of care? 
Sure. Home care actually is a, a fairly new industry. Uh, in reality, uh, if, if you think back uh, where it began to get its roots, it was really in the party supply companies. You know, back in the 60s, uh, if you were renting, uh, you know, tents and, and tables and chairs, you probably rented some wheelchairs along the way and maybe some hospital beds along the way. Uh, if you had some needs probably on the oxygen end, the welding companies who would provide oxygen to the welding uh, supply companies, uh, every once in a while you get a call for oxygen, they say, well, let me deliver one of these big green tanks into the home. So uh, that's kind of where it got its roots. Um, and actually when the Social Security Act was passed and, and Medicare came into law, uh, there was a benefit that was put in there called the Durable Medical Equipment Benefit or the Demi-Post Benefit. And um, again, the, the term we, that sticks with us today when we talk to our regulators is that it's the DME industry, meaning durable medical equipment industry. I don't find that very sexy at all myself. Uh, home medical equipment sounds a little bit better, but I'm still trying to work on a little bit of a, a, a nuance of that. So it, it's, it's a little bit more, um, I don't know, less technical and, and maybe uh, sexy is the word. But uh, when it comes to the regulators, it's durable medical equipment. So yeah, it's evolved from the, uh, from the early days and those party companies uh, sold out and Abbey Rents was a, a big party company back in uh, the probably 60s, 70s. Uh, uh, became one of the larger DME companies, uh, and now it is evolving again. Uh, I started 25 years ago as a uh, respiratory therapist uh, working for a hospital um, in you know, a large hospital in New York City. Uh, entrepreneurial spirit decided I wanted to do something uh, in home care, and I actually worked for a home care company, uh, and then I decided to do it on my own. So uh, the, the problem was back then, and I'd say that to the regulators, if you wanted to get in this industry and you could fog a mirror, you can get a Medicare provider number. Uh, so it was an evolving industry that uh, had many, many, uh, you know, uh, derivatives of it and, and people in our society that came into it and um, over the years it's become more highly regulated, which I think is a good thing. So um, that's essentially where the home medical equipment uh, industry evolved from. Uh, it's continuing to evolve today, as we say, uh, and one of the gentlemen talked back there, it's patient preferred, actually. Uh, it's cost effective. Uh, and you have better outcomes in the home. It's amazing what can be done in the home today uh, as compared to many, many years ago. Um, it, and it's e even 20 years ago, you were taking people out of the ICU and putting them on a ventilator in the home. Uh, these things were unheard of uh, before that, but now it's commonplace, happens all the time. So a lot can be done in the home. It's an evolving industry and uh, again, highly regulated. And in, in my opinion, we are part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, but for too long, there had been um, issues with fraud and abuse in the industry, uh, overutilization. Uh, you still read about it in the paper today, um, so there's kind of that punitive effect from uh, Congress, and they're changing the industry as we speak, and uh, we are now in a competitive bid environment where in the past, if you fogged the mirror, you got a Medicare provider number, you could build Medicare. Now you actually have to uh, bid out on a price and get a contract. Um, they look at one thing only, price point only. Uh, to me, that's counterintuitive to where healthcare should be going. So traditionally, right, the, um, these, this equipment was prescribed by doctors, and Medicare played a big role in how those doctors got paid, correct? Well, yeah, Medicare played a big role in how the doctors got paid. We're paid under the Part B benefit, which is the same benefit the physician is paid under. Uh, and yes, uh, if you're going to build a Medicare benefit, you do need a prescription for this. So it is prescription driven. Um, and it is amazingly um, complicated from a regulatory front. The fact that to get a um, you know, morphine drug, you can do a fax prescription and get it you know, within hours, yet we need a face-to-face -face regulation for a doctor to fill out a lengthy form uh, talking about medical necessity for a, a quad cane is absolutely ludicrous, but some of that comes from the over-regulation uh, due to the fact that there was a, um, a lot of abuse in the industry early on. But yes, it is, uh, is required to have a physician's uh, prescription. So uh, Seth, despite the fact that home care and HME, uh, as Tom just mentioned, provides a, a patient preferred outcome, uh, it, it definitely tends to be lower cost and is effective in treating uh, some ongoing conditions. Over the past five years, we've seen the industry uh, con uh, consolidate um, and constrict and a large part of this was because of competitive bidding, um, which is the regulation by the government through the Medicare um, program. And even though the number of providers continues to shrink in the last five years, the demand for these types of products in the home continues to increase 
exponentially, not only in the United States, but globally. Uh, what do you think that this HME industry is going to look like in the next five to ten years? Uh, Kevin, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, the uh, industry has consolidated significantly on the uh, home medical equipment provider side. Uh, the upside is that the market, while you have that consolidation on the provider side, uh, the baby boomers now hitting retirement, getting older, uh, aging into the Medicare benefit, and needing uh, home medical equipment products, that market is literally exploding. So the market uh, for these products is uh, growing significantly. Some of the uh, statistics uh, regarding uh, the market specifics uh, have 78.2 million now turning 65 at a rate of one every 10 seconds. That's 8,640 a day, uh, about uh, 263,000 uh, a month. Uh, uh, by age 65, uh, there are 65 percent of seniors that have at least one uh, chronic uh, disease and 20 percent of that number have uh, five or more. So there's clearly a need for home medical equipment for these patients. Uh, the industry is evolving. Uh, the model is going to continue to evolve uh, due to the, the regulatory challenges that we're seeing uh, both uh, at a federal uh, level uh, coming out of Washington and uh, at the state level through some of the other uh, Medicaid and, and other payers. Also commercial insurance is a, a significant payer uh, for the industry. Uh, that wave of baby boomers is going to continue for another 14 years, so, you know, pretty solid uh, market growth, uh, you know, when you look at it uh, through uh, 2029. Uh, uh, there's $256 billion is the latest statistic uh, being spent out of pocket on home medical equipment uh, retail products annually, and that rate is also expected to grow about 10% uh, a year. So, you know, again, the, the market... Uh, for these products is, is, is strong, and whenever you have a strong market, you're going to have uh, people come in uh, and, and those business models adapt to meet the needs of that market, uh, you know, regardless of the regulatory challenges, which, uh, you know, currently are providing some uh, pretty significant uh, headwinds. So uh, a, a company like Home Care Concepts, which Tom had founded, was you know, a small regional provider, correct? So. And that's typically how the HM industry has been set up for, you know, pretty much most of its cycle uh, in history. You know, small regional providers that are providing the services directly to the patients. Um, Tom, is that era of standalone HME shops coming to an end, or is it going to be shifting even further? I, I don't think it's coming to an end. Uh, it might have come to an end for my business. We, we were an $8 million company. I found it again in New York, and uh, we bid on... Uh, 32 contracts, uh, and um, we actually won one. So it's hard to go overnight from an eight and a half million dollar company uh, to a two and a half million dollar company. There's something called debt service. You guys remember that, right? So uh, that that was difficult. So uh, we, you know, we, we now have a forbearance agreement. Work with the bank. My partner uh, is in New York trying to figure that out. But um, you know, that that's one market. The New York metro market was a difficult market. There's still many standalone HME companies here. But as Seth uh, alluded to, the fact uh, the demographics are wonderful. So what's happening today actually is private equity is coming into this industry. Uh, people who just have dollars to spend, seed money to spend, the angels, so to say, the angel investors. And they're coming into the industry and we're seeing new larger companies coming in every day that uh, really don't have a clue about the industry, but they know how to make money. Uh, they like the demographics. Um, and I'm seeing, you know, some of those uh, entrepreneurial private equity groups now three years in saying, oh, this, this is quite involved from a regulatory standpoint. So you know, to answer your question, I, I, we are seeing consolidation. We are seeing new private equity coming in. Uh, but I do think, you know, healthcare is local still. Uh, and many of the small companies, uh, and when I define small, I'm talking less than you know, $10 million, still have a pretty good play in this industry and, and do a very, very good job. And uh, they've learned to adapt. And uh, some won more contracts, some didn't. And some, you know, to, to some assess the statistics, you know, went into the retail end. 
they went into other payers beyond Medicare. Uh, and again, Medicare was evolving in the payer concept itself with a lot of uh, managed Medicare, mandatory uh, managed care. So you, you know, if you don't win the Medicare contract, you can get uh, managed care contracts. So um, we'll see a little bit of both, but in likely um, larger companies, more consolidation. But I still do think there'll be some standalone DMEs out there or HMEs. Excellent. Uh, this next question I'd like to pose to Jeremy and Mike, and we'll start with Jeremy. Uh, how has the overall rising cost of healthcare affected the types of products that your company develops? Yeah, so um, from our perspective, obviously Tom alluded to the idea of competitive bidding. So the rising healthcare costs, our customers, the HME providers are under tremendous um, constraints regarding reimbursement that's declining. Um, and so for us, the problem was is there's also a pressure to increase the value that they're also delivering. So they need to be handling more patients, delivering better outcomes with less reimbursement. Um, so one of the things that we actually did is we actually invested in our product, product line. We actually put cellular comms on board for all of our devices. And the idea there is that, yes, there's a cost-constrained environment, but there's an opportunity to gain an efficiency and volume that helps our providers actually deliver on those outcomes without actually increasing the cost. And so I think w that's really resonated with this customer base in terms of, you know, how do you actually do more with less? And, and, and tools like that, I think, are going to help them be successful in the future. Mike, same question. We had to segment a, bit, a little bit here. One thing with these lower reimbursements, this competitive bidding, one thing we realized, it didn't cure old age, right? And so we have, as the demographics that you spoke of, we have this growing population of, of seniors that actually have about 75% of disposable income. So we have a, a large group of people that have money that are having issues with access to care. So we really having to hone the industry skills differently on how we approach our customers. Our company, we've, we've looked at, and by the way, we think of now as customers and as patients. There's really two ways you can go. If into the home, DME, fill a prescription, deliver a hospital bed and set up oxygen, perhaps they're a patient. But you have to start thinking of them now as a customer as well. What other products are they going to need next week that you didn't bring up? Because you know what they're going to do? They're going to go call CVS. So we've had to look at um, a couple of different segments. One, educating our customer base, which is our providers. We sell to providers that would deliver the product on how to go get more referrals and, and, uh, and, and more dollars. Uh, we had to build products really for that competitive bid market that met Medicare standards, but were very, you know, basic items. Um, we looked at teaching providers how to enhance revenue streams from retail and other other revenue streams within our industry, perhaps hospice, whatever it may be. Um, and we're looking now at changing the gold standards. What we think of as an industry as a gold standard needs to change. And we need to redefine ourselves as caregivers and not just delivery service. And that's really what the government has put us into. So we're really trying to educate on those parts of the, our industry right now. And you. Uh touched a little bit on this, but wh where do you see some of the baby boomer shopping trends and attitudes as they trickle down to HME? So boomers are, are more savvy than ever. Again, it's, it's an issue of wants and needs. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, wow, I want a wheelchair today, or I want a hospital bed. Something happens, right? An event has happened, and now they need something. Um, again, with access to care issues, I have to go to my doctor, and I have to do a face-to-face, -face, and I have to do all this. Let me just go buy the thing. Uh, the problem is they may be buying the wrong thing, an appropriate thing. Um, what we've tried to do in understanding that is build products that are appropriate as much as possible in those retail environments, but also look good. You know, you've seen these walkers, everybody has the four-legged walkers. Nobody wants a four-legged walker, and that's what Medicare is going to give you. Everybody wants those sexy rollators, right, the four-wheeled rollators. So you have to adapt, and that's really what we do. I'm also in charge of product development at Drive. We really try to adapt on the retail side products that people want. Um, back to the unsafe issue, we, as these providers um, are having difficulty with getting products to patients through Medicare, patients are having to go online. Now we're trying to figure out and looking at the demographic is who is actually buying these products. And we really find that it's not, it's 
actually generally not the person that needs the product, it's a caregiver. What we see mostly is a sandwich mom, sandwich between children at home and a parent that needs assistance. And they want to do everything they can to make sure that they don't come and live with them. So they buy as much product as they can to really um, make that their parent um, safe and comfortable in the home environment. So that's really who we are trying to market to is that sandwich mom. So Jeremy, uh, a study that came out recently um, from one of your competitors in Georgetown, which we won't name the competitor, um, you know, the, the study basically said that 90% of the baby boomers want to age in place, but only about 30% of them actually thought the technology existed for that to actually happen. So how are you all addressing some of those gaps in the technology that we all know exists, but communicating that? And, and Seth, I'd like for you to jump in on that too after Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so from, from our perspective, you know, we've historically been provider focused in the old world and delivering value for the providers who are actually delivering the equipment. Now we recognize we can't only do that. We also have to deliver on uh, education and empowerment for the patient or the caregiver of loved ones. And so a lot of kind of our shift in focus here is not necessarily just investing in the hardware uh, and the features and benefits associated with that, but really thinking about how do we deliver engagement, um, self-education, um, and, and things like that to the family so that they know the therapy is on, it's working, they're feeling the benefits um, to help kind of drive them to be more self-sufficient. Again, going back to that idea of dealing with, you know, more, less people actually managing more patients. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, you know, consumers are becoming much more educated uh, through the web. They know what they want. They don't want to have to wait uh, to get it uh, you know, similar to the others at the table on the manufacturing side, we're continuing to uh, innovate, listen to our consumers. We're, uh, we pride ourselves, no pun intended, in, in being a listening organization. So we have products that are out there. Uh, we uh, engage the consumers in a listening group. So we're actually getting feedback from them on what they like about the product, what they don't like about the product, what they like to see improved uh, with that product. So then as we're continuing to innovate and redesign our products, we're bringing to market uh, a feature-rich product that addresses the needs of those consumers, whether they're a, a Medicare beneficiary or uh, on the retail side. Uh, any questions for the panelists at this point? Anyone? Uh, Ken, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, Ken and I were talking last night, and you know, he was talking about some customers that he works or some clients that he works with. Really cool technology that I don't know that people know exists or, or they're just beginning to know it exists. Can you touch on that a little bit for the audience, Ken? Thanks. Yeah, actually, while I'm out here this week, my former CEO that I worked for at Datascope and then later at Iris uh, watch, uh, is watching his mother age. And after he sold and made a bazillion dollars, I, had, I lost track of him and I talked to him. He's making just perhaps the most advanced, I can't say much about it, the most advanced drug dispensing system I've ever seen. Now there's packages and boxes and boxes and trays and calendars, forget all that. This is amazingly innovative. I'm gonna go over and spend all of Friday with him. Uh, and I asked him, I said, Cesar, why did you do that? He said, because it needed to be done. And he went on to explain the most simple things that we deal with, watch your parents age and watch the simple little problems. <laughs> And in that is a tremendous opportunity to innovate, to innovate for something that you can really have an impact on healthcare. For 40 years, you always feel like we do something special. I can't imagine anything more special. I'm working with two other companies, Kevin, but the same thing, that you see this and you say, gee, that's amazing, it's gonna work. Information uh, about patient to help them stay out of the hospital I'm working with another company in relation uh, with Johns Hopkins to bring a product to market that's directly linking physicians, hospitals, and patients and caregivers to keep them out of the hospital. Again, what do they want to do? That patient's going to be at home. It's amazing, and as I said earlier, the growth in this. So you got, I mean, we need to think about this whole industry differently because I think there's a giant sucking sound of simple little problems that need to be solved by innovative companies. Simply, cost effectively, but think of your parent and then think of me because I'm going to be there in a few years. 
Thanks, Ken. And having been involved with MedTray for the last eight years, which again brings a lot of new equipment and folks in the industry together, the thing that has always struck me is what Ken just said, is that people have their caregivers for parents or grandparents and they just can't find the product that they need to help make their, uh, you know, their relative's life more comfortable. So they create it. They create it, they bring it to the show. Um, you know, next thing you know, somebody comes along and buys it out. And, because that's not their business. They didn't want to be in a medical device company. They just wanted to help their family member. And some of the most incredible, unbelievable products I've ever seen. And you would have never, and it's like, it's simple stuff, as Ken said. It's like, wow, why didn't, <laughs> I could have made, you know, $5 million if I would have thought of that, you know. And, and again, it, it's based on a need. We have uh, at least three questions in the queue already. We didn't choreograph ahead of time, which is fine. We'll do it on the fly. Um, you, I, I can see that you, I very much appreciate prepared, and you have questions and you want to cover. Can you give me a, a sense of how many, absolutely, you've got to give us 10 minutes because these are really critical points that we need to make versus opening it up because I want to make sure that we cover the really solid stuff too. Why don't we cover some of our solid stuff in the next 10 minutes, and then if we've got a few minutes, we can open it up. Sure, right after my question. Yep. <laughs> after your question, Perfect. of course. <laughs> um, privilege of the guy with the mic, you know. Um, speaking of mics, you made a comment that I thought was really, really interesting. Um, you said, nobody wants a four-legged walker, but that's what you're going to get from Medicare. What is the implication to this room and to people in TV land watching? In relation to what Medicare is willing to provide versus what the wants really are? Uh, relative to that and perhaps what we as a medical device and home care industry can do to better align that which is available to people with uh, less resources um, with their reality. Yeah, difficult question. Our, our providers deal with that every day with, with a reimbursement structure that allows really for you to give the very basic, basic of items that really no one wants. Um, and in some cases are probably now inappropriate because reimbursements have dropped so much. Um, we have tried to develop products that people want at, at lower cost by changing and, and I'm also doing a lot of the manufacturing end of things, we change materials. If it was aluminum before and we can go to steel and the weight of the item really is not the concern, it's more the function. We look at how we manufacture products differently at a cost structure that our providers can be healthy and give a product to the end user that can also be healthy in using it. You know, you gotta go to outcomes and, and we've seen success in the industry where you go to the payer because uh, it's counterintuitive the way Medicare operates today. They've got a value-based purchase system where, in fact, they want to ding the hospital if the patient has a chronic disease like uh, CHF, COPD, and gets readmitted within 30 days, yet they want to have the lowest, uh, you know, commodity product out there in the home. When we go to the hospital payer, and, and back in my company in New York, and say that anybody who comes out and has a diagnosis of CHF, if you put them on our disease management program, we can send a respiratory therapist in the home, we can put them on overnight oximetry, we can see if these patients, which typically 35% of them, have desaturations at night where their oxygen level goes down, that's not typically picked up in the hospital, we can avoid that readmission. And we could save you money on having your patients having less of a readmission rate. Uh, but somebody's going to have to pay for that. It, it's just like telemedicine. It's amazing what can be done in the home. And, and I thought years ago when some of the manufacturers came in with these great telehealth products, it's, you know, we'll wake up and we'll know the patient's weight. So if they're CHF and beginning to retain water, we'll know it. We can act, you know, proactively. Uh, but who's going to pay for it? And, and you know, you've got to follow that payer. You know, we can follow the payer and get them to understand that you'll have better outcomes and save here uh, where you might pay a little bit here. We'll get out of that silo mentality. And so much silo mentality in D.C., it's very frustrating. I'm not going to assume that all of you were able to stay with us after lunch, but I suspect that uh, you would really find uh, Raymond McCauley's talk interesting, so maybe I'll enlist him to okay. engage you a bit in the question and answer session. So 10 minutes, then check in with me, okay? Thank you. <laughs> um, Jeremy, so, you know, we've kind of touched on this idea that, you know, people want the products that they want. Um, and retail and e-commerce is becoming more of a player in HME overall. 
but how do we balance that between you know being having access to the product and also that whole concept that you know the home medical equipment is more than just a commodity it's it's a service industry as well and you know buying a product on amazon doesn't necessarily get you the outcomes that your the patient may be looking for yeah yeah i mean so from our perspective obviously with the rise in consumer directed health plans people are out there shopping looking for products trying to find the best value that they can get for their spend um, the challenge exactly is that we've had is that with the rise of e-commerce chronic disease is not a transactional um, uh, issue, right? You can't just go and go buy something and all of a sudden you're, you know, you're treating your chronic disease. You need education, you need, you need support, especially early on. Um, so from our perspective on the product side and the, the education side, obviously we've invested in that. But then we really look for partners in e-commerce that actually provide that service and support. And that's who we really focus on in terms of how we manage our relationships with our online dealers uh, and who actually is approved and authorized to sell our products. So for our three manufacturers, who, I mean, your customers now, your provider customers in this industry, where do you see a majority of them getting paid? How are they getting paid a majority of your customers right now? Is it still Medicare? Is it moving away more for, away from Medicare? Well, there, there are many different channel partners. Um, you have your strict DME guys that really are trying to survive in this, this competitive world. We do our best to try to teach them of their revenue streams, but you have this emerging population of e-commerce and retail providers, CVS's, Rite Aid's, Walmart's, that are getting into this because as we compress uh, the reimbursements, again, these people still need product. So we see a, a large growth in those, those retail segments. Seth, anything? Yeah, uh, you know, it really depends, you know, I, I'm, specifically within the home care sector in the mobility space. So I know we have respiratory, and I think it's important as we're talking about uh, payers, it, it, it does differ significantly based on the products that you're providing uh, within the uh, home medical equipment uh, industry. From a, a power mobility uh, perspective, uh, you know, five years ago, Medicare was the primary payer. Uh, due to the regulatory challenges, Medicare is no longer uh, or, or is just uh, marginally the, the primary payer. Uh, Medicaid's a, a significant payer. Uh, we're, we're seeing uh, consumers that want uh, standard power, uh, standard uh, power wheelchairs, uh, going out and actually paying retail for some of the, the lower cost items because, you know, they can't get what they need through Medicare. So they're looking at other channels. Internet is uh, a channel that uh, is continuing to grow for some of the more uh, retail items. Uh, scooters, when you get down uh, uh, on the very low end of the uh, power mobility side, whether it's a three-wheel or a four-wheel uh, uh, scooter, uh, those are largely retail. Medicare pays for a very small uh, portion of that. Medicaid uh, as well. So that's largely a, a retail transaction and that's one of the ways that our customers are continuing to adapt as they're looking at other channels as the Medicare uh, market is uh, shrinking uh, due to the regulatory challenges. Uh, you know, they're looking at other uh, revenue streams to uh, make that up uh, retail uh, and the internet being one. Thank you. So and this is really for any of the panelists, and uh, Tom, why don't you jump in first. Uh, some are saying that much of the routine primary care that normally takes place currently in a physician's office uh, will one day be done at home. Uh, is that even a possibility, and how far away do you think we are from that future? We're here today if we can get paid for it. <laughs> you know, that, that's, again, the problem. I go back to telehealth. I go back to the reimbursement of the home care physician, the doc that's going to actually you know, make the trek to the home. Uh, and can it be done uh, via, you know, Skype and telehealth and, 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 and you know, good uh, telemedicine where you can get the results and, and make changes. So um, we, we too often follow the reimbursement and, and we don't follow the needs of the patient. Um, so I, I do believe it's going to get here sooner rather than later. We've got no choice that it's got to get there. Um, but but I, somebody's got to get paid for this at the end of the day. And we too, too often look at traditional payment uh, as Medicare. And, and Medicare, again, developed in the 60s, they still got a benefit for iron lungs out there. Uh, the Medicare benefit actually is for patients in the home. So if you really wanted to use that wheelchair outside of the home, guess what? According to Medicare, you're, you're not able to. It's for in-the-home use. And we've been trying for a decade to get the in-the-home use uh, 
you know, terminology out, out of the, uh, the Social Security Act, but it's, uh, it's not been successful. So the frustration and the, and the challenges remain with the payer, uh, but the technology uh, is evolving. And, you know, my, my concern when I talk up on the Hill is that if you continue to take dollars out of the industry, the first thing that's going to go is going to be R&D. And if you start to thwart technology, uh, we're really going to see an issue. It would be unfortunate to see the American citizen not seeing what people get around the world because we don't have an evolving technology uh, which can really help in the, in the cost structure. What, what's the biggest resistance to getting the words in the home off that legislation? Is it just it would be? It's opening up the benefit um, again, and it's just the regulatory and, and process of getting anything passed in this particular government is challenging. And, and at, at this point, we've worked around it enough that there are more challenging issues out there that um, it, it's not been worked on in a couple of years. But, uh, you know, I don't know, Seth, if you want to comment on that, because you were kind of involved in that at one point, the in the whole home rule. Um, at the end of the day, I'm not quite sure it's, uh, we've got the energy, the time, the dollars to get that changed. Seth? Yeah, and uh, specific to the in the home, I mean, from a mobility uh, perspective, that's an area where we have seen some change. We've had extensive discussions with Medicare. There's actually a lawsuit uh, back in uh, 2003, uh, the Olmstead Act, right. where uh, state Medicaids are unable to apply that in the home uh, restriction uh, to Medicaid coverage because Medicaid, as, as the, the last payer, uh, has to uh, provide for payment in the least restrictive setting. And uh, if you have that in the home restriction, uh, the, the court found that you were not allowing them to transition from an institution uh, back to the home and community, uh, you know, where, you know, Medicaid recipients, they're not necessarily aging into the benefit. You know, they're, they're in the benefit because they have an income uh, issue, uh, by and large, and they're younger, they're a younger population, they can work, they can go to school, and uh, that's, what they, that's what they really should be doing. They should be uh, able to be an active uh, participant, uh, not only with their family in the home, but also in their uh, community. So we are making progress on that, and uh, you know we're we're hopeful based on a proposed rule on the home health uh, side back in uh, 2010 that there will be uh, a change to that in the home rule potentially later this year. Uh, and I think just to comment a little bit on the telehealth side, we're actually seeing um, some of the new codes on discharge, discharge coordination codes, some chronic care management codes that's starting to open up the idea around telemonitoring. The problem, I think, in the past historically is there's a fear that in a fee-for-service world, if we add more codes to bill to, then our cost just goes up without anything coming out. And I think in this new world of shifting for fee-for-value, when you start putting some sticks in place in terms of readmission penalties, it's given CMS the opportunity to open up some other new codes to help kind of coordinate care to help offset the, 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 the cost there. The problem for our customers is those are all physician-based codes, right? They're not the ones that are actually caring for the patient in the home. Um, so it's been a real challenge, and it, hoping at some point, right, there, I mean, there is a telemonitoring code, HICPIC code, which is what our customers provide to, but there's no fee associated with it, right? So they're essentially doing it for free. What we found in some of our more advanced providers is they're looking for products that bring things together that allow them to create an offering where they're actually going to health systems or small payer plans, and they're actually getting preferred arrangements, similar to what Tom was saying, which is, you know, if you give me your COPD patients coming out of the hospital, we'll take care of them, we'll keep them out and you'll if you pay us a per member per month fee you'll actually get the benefit and the savings on the readmission reduction um, so we're seeing a lot of inventive ways of coming about that but ultimately i think our providers really need to benefit from a direct payment model to help really kindle the outcomes that people want to see in terms of what we can deliver in the home from better care outcomes are so key i mean the problem is if you, new technology very often with a new code and, and the yeah. dme benefit uh, shows increased utilization. You know, non-invasive yeah. ventilation is a perfect example. Uh, great new technology where you can non-invasively ventilate somebody at home. You don't have to put a tracheostomy tube into them. Um, so that spikes an increase in utilization. So then the auditors start to come in and say, what's going on here? So uh, again, maybe I'm showing a little bit of my uh, Washington frustration coming out, but uh, there's got to be a better solution, and, and there is. 
Excellent. So let me, let me wrap it up with this. Um, I think we've sort of touched on the whole idea of, of the overall continuum of care and where that is now and as it continues to evolve and how all the different uh, sectors of healthcare are involved, including HME. Um, and I want to give everybody an opportunity to answer this question. We'll start with Tom and work our way down. Tell us why a strong HME home care sector is really good for the overall continuum of care. Well, I, I mean, it started out with an early comment. It's, it's patient preferred. It's it's cost, uh, it's not, it, you know, it's cost uh, effective, uh, and if we can get it to be outcome based, that's where patients want to be. We want to age in place. You want to age in the home. Uh, you know, my dad had a stroke recently. He lived with me for a year and a half. We just got him out of rehab. Uh, he couldn't wait to get out of that rehab facility. So now he's in, he's at home for a week. Well. There are challenges there. I've got all the DME that I want or the HME that I want, but there's still challenges there. Um, but this is where the patients want to be. Um, and we've just got to figure out, I think, that, again, the reimbursement, uh, and uh, it'll work because uh, we are part of the solution. We're not part of the problem. And uh, I believe we're going to get there someday. But uh, it appears to me the only way we get there is becoming a, an advocate and uh, lobbying our government. and. And the legislators are beginning to age in place and change themselves, so they're beginning to get a little bit more empathetic. So I, I have hope. Yeah, so from my perspective, on top of the wanting to age in place and be in a, a place that's comfortable, um, I mean, anybody that follows the spend, you know, the $9,000 per American, it's all related to chronic disease, right? And chronic disease is managed outside the four walls of the hospital. If that patient is admitted to the hospital, it's too late and it's too costly. And the home care industry is really going to be the key, if not the key, to managing patients, helping patients understand why they need to take their medications, helping them understand why they need to be adherent to their therapy, and be engaged, engaging in, in caregivers and loved ones within the home to support that patient to make sure that they're staying adherent to therapy and staying out of the hospital. Ultimately, that's where we're going to see our cost savings come in. On the technology side, we are trying to focus on products that will give better outcomes. Outcomes are key. Keeping these people that want to be at home out of the hospital. We're looking at new respiratory devices that can lower COPD admit readmissions uh, first month by 50%, over a year as much as 80%. Um, so we're trying to, to rebrand ourselves as an industry as caregivers that are going to reduce cost and bring better outcomes. So that's really our focus for the future. You know, I, I think Tom really, uh, you know, hit the nail on the head. Ultimately, it comes down to cost, uh, regardless of the payer, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance. Uh, all payers are, are looking at the economics and they're saying, look, we want more, but we want to pay less. And, you know, ultimately, home care, uh, you know, is a solution to that. Uh, there's a lot of support. Uh, by public policymakers uh, recognizing the, the true value of home care and the fact that that's where the patient ultimately wants to be treated, uh, you know, in, in their last days of life, uh, in their home, surrounded by their family and friends. Nick, tell them uh, who you are and what you do. I'm Nick Anderson. I'm a payer. So I determine what Intermountain Healthcare reimburses and what we don't. And um, I think the five of you are sitting on a gold mine. I think I've been really happy to hear the discussion, and I think you're all on to it with technology. And just as the, you know, 50 years ago we had a mainframe computer, there were only a few of them in the United States. Now everyone has a supercomputer in their back pocket, and your four year old can use it. Um, we're leaving the hospital and we're going to the home. All healthcare with the exception of surgery, is going to the home. Diagnostics and all of that. But the, I think the DME and home health company that wins is the DME and home health company that stops talking about billing and coding. That it's like talking about the Ferrari Enzo in context of the horse and buggy and saying, I, I just invented this new Bugatti Veyron. I just got to get the horse and buggy to catch up. Right. Well, no, the point of the automobile is to get rid of the horse and buggy. The point of digital health, telehealth, is to get rid of billing and coding and CPT codes. And all home health care, it's not going to be for the Medicare population, it's going to be for all of us. Newborns on up, we're going to diagnose ourselves at home, we're going to, in many respects, treat ourselves at home. 
It, everyone needs to look up a company called Apollo DX and 3PDX, Biomeme, the company I'm associated with that I mentioned the other day, Steffi, that you're going to breathe in your own phone and Amazon's going to home deliver you your medications. You know, and I think that I think that all of us that are in the home health, digital health world, are sitting on a gold mine, saying we're we're done with the hospital networks, we're done with billing and CPT, we're done with the Nick Andersons of this world that are the gatekeepers saying right. I'm not going to reimburse for that, I'm not going to reimburse for that, and instead just saying I'm just going to go to the home health and concierge medicine, which I think would be a great discussion next year at this conference, concierge healthcare. Sure, um, that's where healthcare is going. Let's put it on the agenda. You got it. You just Topic. Okay. <laughs> Next, comments? Outcomes. I mean, that's a, you said it well. Unfortunately, we're traditionally facing codes, regulation, and that's the way uh, healthcare has been. If we can be, begin to focus on patient outcomes, at the end of the day, a better health outcome is going to have a lesser spend, I would think. It's, it seems to be, you know, intuitive. Getting ahead of the issue is key. And I think what we're going to be seeing in technology, and, I, and to Tom's point earlier, I'm not sure if it's going to be our industry, someone else is going to come in and, and force this down our throats, but um, how many times do, does a patient go to the refrigerator, that consumer go to the refrigerator day? How many times do they go to the restroom? How many daily activities are they uh, performing a day and at, at what times? You start t looking at that as feedback into a data point, you can develop algorithms to see if there's, there's going to be an exacerbation coming up. We start seeing a decline in how many times someone goes to the refrigerator, how many times they do this. Now, we do a little bit of that now. We have diabetic monitors that will communicate um, compliance. You have uh, CPAP that will communicate compliance. We have a lot of single data points. We need to look at the whole life of that, that person that mm -hmm. at home and that will help us get ahead and say look based on these algorithms someone needs to get in there and take a look it seems like mrs smith is is having some issues with x and that's what's i think really going to change our industry yeah i mean you know from our perspective you know they, they talk about you know clayton christensen the innovators dilemma right you know we are in the middle of disruption right and there are people who are going to figure it out there are going to people that are going to go concierge route, e-commerce, focus on the out-of-pocket pay. There are people that are going to go after outcomes, therapy management programs, disease management programs. And it's going to be really interesting to see how everything unfolds in the future. Our next question is from Rick Drace. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here this morning. Um, my, co yeah, my company is Metalutions, and we make a product called the BioBack, which is a solution for low back pain which affects 25% of the uh, population overall, and that percentage grows to about 30% in seniors. And so, you know, but as a small company, we've really had to focus, uh, you know, a narrow focus on what markets we go to. And as we all heard last night, trying to sell th through doctors is a real challenge. Um, we have not yet really looked at the home care uh, segment. And so my question is, is it the home care agencies that we'd be looking to? And if so, what percentage of those are set up to bill for DME POS? Thank you. I mean, you need to get a code, and maybe the manufacturers can talk, uh, you know, about getting a code. And, and, and again, you have to have a code that's reimbursable. Uh, and if your defining market is 30% of the elderly and it's the Medicare population, you've got to go get a, a code through CMS. Uh, and I would agree with you. My dad's at home, and he's got a chronic back issue. And if he got something that'll help him, I'd probably buy it, uh, if it's reasonable, um, because I need to get a better outcome there, because I see what that chronic back pain does. But I'd let a manufacturer maybe walk that through there. You said it yourself, there's a huge population of people with back pain. Trying to get a code, he's pushing a rock up a hill. It's, all right, well, so now getting it reimbursed, getting it referred, all good stuff, but difficult. I don't know how it's packaged. I don't know how it's, it's educated to the user, but that retail market right now, if, it's a, if it can be packaged as a, a mass market retail item, is where you can find some real gold. Um, running it through hospitals, running it through referral sources, running it through doctor's offices, it's difficult. Uh, the, the, the other piece of advice that I would give you, and I, I don't know where you are in the, in the process, is you know, from a clinical perspective, showing the clinical efficacy of that having a university or an independent organization look at that with a small test group to actually provide the data that then you would use uh, to advocate for the need for this product uh, within, you know, the payer mix. So I, I think that's very important to have 
that type of uh, study, clinical study, to uh, you know speak to the efficacy and and the appropriateness of that product. I don't know what you guys are doing on May fourth, twenty sixteen, but if you're able to come back because. Clearly, we have much more to talk about than our time will allow. Okay, so there's an invitation. Our next question is from Leo. Hi, my name is Leo Eisner. I uh, deal actually with home use products on the standard side, so standards development. I'm on a brand new committee in IEC. Um, it's a system committee, which is a new concept. So they're getting a whole bunch of committees together and working with Continua, which you may know of. It's a plug and play for home use. And uh, so I've worked with several companies that have monitoring products that go to the home. Who controls that product? Is it the hospital or is it you guys? Well, the home health agency, uh, I, again, I think it's evolving and, and it hasn't found its niche yet, in, in my opinion. Um, but typically, I, I would believe it's going to be more the home health uh, part. I, I'd like it to say it's going to be us. It'll be a, hopefully us providing it to the home health agencies, but I, I would think that's probably where it's going to find its most comfortable niche. I'll let the other gentleman respond. Yeah, so on the telemonitoring side, like the base station with the peripherals, that's typically a home health agency that would then be managing that. Um, and then on the DME side, we're seeing a lot more connected devices, and that's where the manufacturer is selling to the distributor, the home medical equipment provider, and they are actually owning the products until it's actually uh, the benefits transferred to the patient. Many times those referral sources do want to see the compliance, though they're paying for it, they want to make sure you're also using the product, so they tend to stick their nose into it as well. And that's where the technology has been wonderful when yeah. you talk about ResMed, who in the past we had to send somebody into the home, ask the questions to verify are they using their sleep uh, apnea device. Um, well, you can get a daily real-time read uh, of what's going on, and, and if they average six hours a night and all of a sudden you see a change that they're, they're into two hours a night or they're not using it, you can have an intervention and prevent a readmission. So it's, it's, it's been terrific. Our next question is from Libby Englander, who um, I've become friendly with. I don't completely understand what she does yet, but Ken told me, you don't know it yet, but Libby is your greatest business accomplishment in my life by virtue of the fact that she's here she met him, she talked to Rob Packard, and he said, 30, 60 days from now, this is gonna be a huge thing. So no pressure. Congratulations <laughs> in advance. And uh, maybe give him just a snippet of what you're doing and what your question is. Thank you. Thank you so much, that was overwhelmingly nice. Um, we, my point is very much to what we do and the interaction of what you guys do. I run a software company that with a push of a button tells you all the adverse events and hopefully um, with some collaborations and outcomes research in terms of medical devices. So if you have a medical device, I can tell you the adverse events, the product problems. We can compare it between class, device, and company. It's very cool, it's very interesting information, and it's very actionable. But the point is that in a sense, in our software system, you can push a button and get all that information. For us to teach our clients how to use our system effectively and understand the impact of the information so that they can take that level of action is not a one-day process. Um, right now we work for insurance companies that do product liability analysis. So they really want to insure the medical device industry. They don't want to step in it. So what they do is they hire us to look at leading trends and indicators. They get a subscription to our service and they can look at any device and say, okay, here's the trends of the mod reports. Here's the real product problems. We can do free tech searches and get all sorts of great stuff. So that's the end goal is like so tantalizing and wonderful to have in your hand a comparison of in this device class, here's the good guys and here's the bad guys, or of course, you know, the ones that are having challenges at the moment. But even to obtain that information, which is very much of a, a goal that they're excited about, um, it's not an easy train. It takes a couple days of working with our underwriters and showing them the system and understanding the risk scores. We color code it so it's red for like danger and green for your good. But even then it's a challenge. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because to Nick's point where the, the industry is going in this direction, and it absolutely is, the demographics, the economics, but still you have people at home who are elderly, uh, middle-aged, Often the home health care aides are kind and wonderful people. They actually haven't been to Harvard engineering. 
you're going to have a challenge of taking that gap of what the technology can do and what the information can present and making sure that it's really accessible to the people who you're now starting to shift the home care into their hands. And I think that interaction of, of machine and person, which, I mean, the reason that Steve Jobs is so famous is because he took that head on. He said, look, you know, the technology is great, but what we want to do is make it usable and beautiful and accessible. And I think actually one of your huge challenges is not only the payers and the, you know, I, I, just, I just thought it was wonderful how Nick Anderson said, look, put me out of business, please. I think that that was like a noble and true statement. But to do that, there's a gap not only of creating the technology and the channels, but also thinking about who the, the end user is and making sure that you understand how they're going to experience your product and making sure that they take away from the diagnostic and the action of their medical care what you really want them to do. And I'm just saying that that's a whole new area of expertise that actually people should start now doing R&D in. That was, I should have asked a question, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Right. I just, I just yeah. think what, you, what you're well doing said. is so vital. You know, my, my father-in-law is 95 years old. He's the most amazingly wonderful guy. He's a little frail. He's sharp as a tack. He wants to stay home. He will, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to drug him and, and kidnap him to get him out of his house. And we want to give him the best care. He's, he's brilliant. But, you know, if you ask, tell him, here's the machinery to use, it's not going to be helpful. You know, you need to do things. I have a question for Libby. Are, are you excited about what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have a comment? Feedback? I, I agree with what you're saying. I, at Drive, the best thing about Drive is we have 3,000 items. The worst thing about Drive is we have 3,000 items. And those items go from the very basic of a walker all the way up to some you know, high technology and other products like respiratory. And we do see that interface issue. You, you have a, a person at home that now has some type of, uh, of uh, occurrence in their life that has, has taken them off their game and now they have to deal with bathroom safety products, maybe respiratory products, mobility products, and to try to understand how to communicate that back <coughs> to some source, whether it's through a home care provider um, or their doctor, whomever, is difficult. We are trying to make products that take that out of the situation or out of the conversation for them, build respiratory items that are self-adjusting, self-dosing, so they don't have to worry about that. Building products that, that are easy to use and, and cognitively easy to adjust, whatever it may be. So we understand that, um, but it's a difficult question. As in life, Mike has a, a comment and the last statement on the session. Thank you, Joe. Um, so full disclosure, Mr. Gaffney and Mr. Ryan are clients of mine. And the reason that I'm really excited about these guys being here, and you guys are gonna be excited too, is because there's so much buzz and there's all these manufacturers that are developing product that we're gonna see come into the space. And so uh, it's awesome, and it's, it's piggybacking what he was saying. The disruption is significant, and it's going to be so disruptive that you're not going to need insurance pay. It's going to be cash pay, which is really great. So my question is this. As a manufacturer who's looking to get into this space or has a developed product, how can MedTrade help them? How can A Home Care help them? Well, from a Metroid, right, Metroid, there you go. Yeah, from a Metroid standpoint, I would say that, as I alluded to earlier, a lot of these products came, you know, come to the show because they're looking to find the market and learn more about the industry, and so there are a lot of opportunities there. I mean, we bring thousands of people together that are interested in buying these products to uh, get them in front of their patients. Um, we have, you know, hundreds of companies that bring, you know, standard, you know, tried and true products to something that was invented in their garage you know, two months ago and they brought it to the show. So there's a lot of opportunities to get in front of this marketplace to better understand it. And you know, Joe kind of put you on the spot a little bit, so hopefully we'll see you at Metrade as well. Um, but I would be happy to provide you with information to pass along to all of your audience um, and have all of you come to Metrade as my guest to you know, take part in the conference, take part in the trade show. If you want to learn more about it and spend more time with these folks and, and other folks like them, I'd be happy to provide you with some it's information. It's an important there. conversation. 
Tom, did you have something to add? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously MedTrade is a very good partner of ours, and, and I've seen uh, more innovation and new products that were in the new product pavilion that, um, you know, a year later are on the main floor and, and, and quite, you know, well adopted and, and used throughout the industry. So that's important. Uh, as far as what AA Home Care can do, I mean, we're evolving ourselves. We're finding that, um, you know, we're, we're in town. We're, we're a lobbying uh, advocacy organization. We represent all the HME uh, companies, uh, well, most of them in the industry, uh, manufacturers. Uh, and there are regulatory challenges in getting your products out there. Um, there are certainly challenges that uh, you might need to have a, a legislative uh, strategy for that. So that's potentially where we could be helpful. I would love to see um, an, an innovative uh, council out of AA Home Care where we have a group of entrepreneurs out here who are trying to solve the solutions, who are trying to come up with ideas in, in medical technology and, and we could you know, get bright minds together and I can get my regulatory team together who is very focused on regulation, regulation, and we could kind of come to a, a strategy of where we take that product and I, that idea from an idea to a product uh, to actually mainstream. And uh, we don't have that counsel yet, but uh, we're, we're an evolving association, so maybe we will. Uh, it really just takes innovative, bright people who want to uh, have an outcome that we think is important. Three closing comments from me. First, profound thanks. Thank you for being here. Second, when you come back next year, none of this, I'm showing up for my session, I wasn't here the day before, you come for the whole damn thing because people want to talk to you, okay? Sure. So stay as late as you can today. Third, and I mean no offense to the other gentleman, Michael, would you come to the, the center here, right, and stand up here with me, and I'll tell you why. Uh-oh. Because I've been doing this conference for three years, and my mother-in-law is like, who would go to a conference that you put on? Like, whatever, couldn't relate to it. Well. We recently bought her a new drive medical device, which she loves. And um, I said, you know, there's a guy from Drive Medical coming to my conference. She was like, really? Like, you? Uh, just let's hug it out. Because <laughs> what you've done is if you, you've legitimized me as a son-in-law. Like, the whole thing has come together like, wow, like the guy from Drive. So, Rich, where are you? Can you? Yeah. Uh, everyone get in the background too. Just yeah. Yeah, okay. I do. I do have a phone. I have a phone full of customers using our product. I get excited about it as well when I see right. someone. I everyone like say it. hi, Janet. Janet. Hi, Janet. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's hear it for them. Thank you. Thank you.